Dr. Linda, what led you to begin a career in psychology? I never started out wanting to be a psychologist. Um, I did my first degree in Canada. And as part of the degree, you needed to take back then a humanities course. Um, and I chose psychology. I thought I wanted to be, you know, a writer. I loved writing, I loved stories. And I took this, you know, intro first year psychology course and I just had the most amazing lecture and became completely kind of besotted with, with this topic. And I realized the reason that I, you know, thought I wanted to be a writer is because I was actually interested in human stories and the human experience. And here was a discipline that allowed you not only to kind of delve into those human stories, but to use science to understand how those stories came about. So um, I changed my major within a few sort of months, couple months of starting uh, the course. And uh, yeah, I never looked back. I did my first degree and um, I was going to do my clinical training and PhD. Actually, I had a place to go um, and do it in, in sort of sunny California. And at the time, my boyfriend, who is my husband now, was like, no, I'm in England. You love London. Come and do it in the UK. And I swear, I came over and it rained nonstop for two weeks. So like, you know, I was like, okay, this doesn't prove <laughs> how committed I am, nothing well, but no, it worked out well. So I, I do think sometimes kind of circumstances or even sort of countries choose you. I've been in the UK ever since and it's kind of, you know, I've loved my time here, but it wasn't something that was kind of on my sort of plan as it were. That's a brilliant question. You know, I think to some extent, I think first of all, we need to begin to like recognize what stress, what anxiety looks like. And sometimes it looks like agitation. Sometimes it feels like being overwhelmed or being tired. Sometimes, you know, it, it feels like being disengaged. I think it's about learning to take your own emotional temperature as it were. And I would often say to people is, you know, look at the basics, right? How are you eating? How are you sleeping? How are you moving? That'll often give you a good indication. We know when our sleep is disturbed, it has a profound impact on our, our mental health, on our mood, on our way that we process anxiety. If we're seeing sort of changes in eating, if we started really overeating or undereating, we know that again, not just with the behavioral side of it, but with our microbiome, right? That can have a huge impact again on how we process emotions. And if we're very lethargic, if we're not getting any exercise, moving around that has an impact as well so I think the first thing is, is to get the basics right make sure you take your emotional temperature and if you do find that things just don't feel right then the, it's, it's really critical that we have I guess a sense of entitlement over speaking about our feelings you know um, I've been doing this job for so long kind of speaking sort of to the public about it one of the things I, I've always harped on about is kind of just that you know sense of if, if you and I were speaking and uh, you know and you said Linda what's wrong with your arm I'd say oh I've got a broken arm and you'd see it and we'd make space for that you wouldn't ask me to sign anything or to wait because you'd know my arm was broken but because so many of the mental health issues we have aren't seen it's it's a difficult thing to have a conversation about so I think the only way we begin is by by kind of normalizing it, understanding that sometimes we have bad days and that's cool, that's fine. And also normalizing the idea that we're social beings, we're not meant to do this on our own. So whether it's a partner, a family member, a friend, or a good doctor, a GP, a therapist, someone that can help you, you know, if you're feeling like this over an extended period of time, please, by all means, reach out. You know, that, that's the way that this gets better. The sooner you reach out, I think one of the fundamental things that you need to get your head around is taking care of your future self. When we want behavioral change, usually the, the benefits are far away and the costs are immediate, right? So I want to eat healthier. Well, if I forego the piece of cake now, well, that's a cost to me now. And the benefit is maybe in a month or so, I'll feel better or look better, but the cost is immediate, right? If I want to go to the gym, the cost, the feeling tired is immediate. And the benefit, well, it'll take ages before I see the muscle definition. And that's true of everything. I want to stop smoking. Cost is immediate. Benefits down the line. Okay, so I get a couple extra years at the end of my life. So the trick in terms of a mental hack, it's about sort of turning those around, right? So how can you bring benefits into the forefront of your mind, right? And kind of push those costs away. And part of it is about engaging with your future self, right? So, you know, th there's this, there's this idea that if you can find your why, you can find your how. So what is your why? Do I want to be healthier so I can see my kids grow up, so I can fit into that dress, so I can, you know, not 
you know, uh, hyperventilate because of all the smoking when I go up the stairs. Like, what is my why? Once you have that, then the how becomes easier. And you can do several things to, to ensure that you're doing that. For example, um, take away barriers to making the right choices. If I want to eat healthier, having a fridge full of junk is not going to help. Stop buying it. It's not in the house. It's really simple. It's just easier not to have it. If I want to work out, you know, and sure, am I a morning person? Great. I'm going to book as soon as I wake up straight out the door and I'm going to go and do that. Am I an evening person? I'll do it there. I'm not going to do it at a time where it feels particularly emotionally taxing. And thirdly, I'm going to validate myself. And here's the really important one. When you want to achieve behavioral change, so many times we focus on outcome. Don't do that. We need to focus on action, right? So again, to use the weight example, if I'm standing on the scales, sometimes I'll go up, sometimes I'll go up, down, but, you know, and that will really affect my self-esteem, my confidence, my belief in what I'm doing. I'm not going to validate myself for every time the scales move. I'm going to validate myself instead for every time I've chosen sort of the healthy sort of fish and salad over the burger. I'm going to validate myself every time I've gone to the gym. I'm going to focus on action versus outcome because if you focus on action enough, the outcome's inevitable. If there's a relationship there, there's a mutual goal. I think you need to redefine what the mutual goal is. So in this case, if it's a working relationship, then presumably the mutual goal is to the, you know, to the benefit of some sort of project or some sort of outcome. Um, I think there's something important about kind of having enough communication to be able to sort of say, okay, we both want to make sure that we meet our target this year. The only way we do this is if we're able to work together. That doesn't mean we have to enjoy a holiday together. We don't have to name our kids after each other. We don't, need, but we need to be able to communicate to the point that it, it's mutually beneficial because ultimately it sounds like if you can't do that, there's kind of the whole, not necessarily mutually assured destruction, but certainly it, it's detrimental to the whole process. So again, what is your why, right? I may, you know, you're, you're kind of focused too much on defining the problem rather than looking at the solution. And again, in the workplace, the solution isn't we need to be best friends. The solution is we need a viable, positive working relationship. Now, this can be fostered in a couple of ways. I'm assuming they have a line manager, and sort of that's kind of oftentimes a great way to kind of whether it's an HR department or a manager that can help facilitate this. If they're just business partners, then perhaps it's about putting it to a test and saying, well, look, let's see if we can figure this out. And if not, perhaps we have to call it a day. But, you know, there's something really important. I think this is true of any relationship, personal or professional, that you shouldn't walk away unless you've tried everything you can to fix it. You know, it's much easier to walk away in doing that. So kind of framing this as a last chance to figure it out, speaking, and I think when you speak, it's trying to avoid emotive language, sort of, you did this, you did that. It's much more about taking responsibility. Look, when you do X, I feel Y. So maybe when you interrupt me, I feel disrespected. Maybe you're not trying to disrespect me, but that's what I feel. So in which case I can say, oh my gosh, I, you know, no, I just get really excited when we speak, so I interrupt you because I try and add on to something. In which case you can say, okay, well, that's great to know. Maybe what we can do is function in a way that, you know, I, I, you know, you interrupt me right at the end and then we can build on it like that. Would that work? So automatically we're kind of on the same side rather than kind of positioning this problem between us. We're putting it in front of us, sitting next to each other and trying to figure it out. One of the first things the parents need to understand is that unlike for them, there's no online and offline for kids. So this device, which is a device that they're maybe being bullied on, is also probably the device that they're getting support from, connecting with other kids with, right? So one of the things that our research has found um, is that many times we, you know, kids won't open up to parents about what's going on because they fear their devices are going to be taken away, they're going to be confiscated and whatnot. So what I would say is first things first, when you first get your child online, number one, you know, do it slowly. Number two, ensure that you are on top of it. You're aware of how, you know, what social media platforms are on, what they're doing. And number three, have a concrete set of rules, right? So for example, you know, devices we know interfere with studying, they interfere with sleep, they interfere with a lot of stuff. So you can't use them while you're studying. It's, you know, you have to give them back by 7, 30, 8 o'clock at night. And during the dinner time, you know, no one has devices around and we actually speak as a family. That's very important. The second thing is kind of understanding that their digital footprint is there forever. So what I would say to my daughter always is if you're not happy to wear it on a t-shirt, 
don't put it online because it's it's going to be like wearing it on a TV with your t-shirt forever. So, you know, get them to understand the permanence, which is a scary thing, which is something that we didn't have to grow up with. And thirdly, I think it's also having a really sort of, and not just a one-off talk, but an ongoing talk about the difference between doing what we're doing now is just having verbal communication, feeding off of each other sort of visual cues and writing something online, which can be misconstrued or, you know, or misinterpreted and ultimately hurt somebody. So, you know, I've heard cases where kids have felt they were bullied because they were cropped out of a picture, but you speak to the other kid and the other kid's like, oh, I didn't realize it just, the picture didn't fit. So it wasn't meant to do this or something that can be, you know, again, construed as a joke. If you're verbalizing it, construed very differently online. So having a real conversation about that, right? So understanding that you can end up in the position of bully inadvertently, but also if you are being bullied, and this is critical to speak to a parent as soon as possible to say, look, even though, you know, this is no different to you being bullied elsewhere. And, you know, and my go-to place is not going to be, that's it, no more technology forever, but it's going to be, how do we work on this to support you to, to get through it? What do you do outside of work that helps you maintain a healthy, well-balanced life? I guess my the thing that keeps me balanced is my family. Um, super good, I'm an only child and I have an only child. Like, you know, we're extremely close. And my cousins are a big part of my family and my parents and my little girl who's now 18 and off to uni and my husband. So we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of communication, a lot of connection. We check in with each other a lot. So over the dinner table every day, we'll speak about you know the best thing about the day. So you know we kind of try and keep it quite about being grateful. I think that's a big one. You know what you know what can we be grateful for? And we you know when we work hard and we play hard. I think that's the other thing. You know we invest in our work, but I always have things in the diary to look forward to. You know whether it's a coffee with a friend or going back to Cyprus to visit the family. That always helps. And in terms of the motto that I live by. Um, and I always have, and this is something my, my parents would always tell me, is sort of, you know, just be, just be nice to people because they're fighting a battle. And I've got to say, I know this isn't, you know, um, particularly new, but as a psychologist, you realize that genuinely, you know, everyone's fighting this internal struggle. And if we all just made a little bit more space for each other, we just had a little bit more goodwill when someone isn't smiling or isn't having a good day to kind of, allow them that space it's amazing how that then gets sort of passed on and um and that's just the thing i always try having back in my mind